I was a second year man, a middler, they call them. You're a, you're a freshman, you're a middler, and then you're a senior in the traditional programs. Today they got so many weird ones, who knows. But uh, I was a middler, and as a middler, I was required to begin my first unit uh, CPU. Uh, and what we did was you had to be placed in an institutional setting. In my middle year, I was given the University of Kentucky Medical Center, particularly the emergency uh, room area. And when an injury would come in, a gunshot or a knife, or you know, pretty common up there in the mountains, um, the doctors and nur nurses would rush to the patients, and then I was, my, my job, my instruction was to rush to the families and deal with the crazy coming through the door, you know, oh, my husband shot himself five times, huh? Five times, really? Anyway, I had to deal with the family, and it was, I was, I was on the weekend thing, so I did, you know, 12 hours Friday, 12 hours Saturday, 12 hours Sunday, and then I had a couple few days off, which was great, because, you know, I had schoolwork to do and everything else. But I remember, uh, we, we were coming down to the end of the semester, it was time for finals, and Chuck Killian, my favorite prof, because he was nuts. I mean, really a nuts kind of guy, and I got along with him just fine. Uh, we came in to class, and we all sat down, and he said, of course, take out your blue books. And then he sat there for a moment, and then he thought, well, you know what? I don't want to sit here and watch you write for two hours. I'll tell you what we're going to do. I'm going to put a question on the board. Uh, you take your blue books and get out of here and go home and bring them back Monday, and that'll be your exam. So he put a question on the board, he wrote it up there, and he had a little thing hiding it so we couldn't see, and he lifted the little thing, and the question was quite simple. The question was, what is God? I went, wow, well, that's kind of an open-ended question, isn't it? He said, you guys can write as much or as little as you wish, but be very careful. You have the whole weekend to think about it. Be very careful because how you answer this question will not only reflect upon what you believe about God, but how he also is impacting your life, even to the point of whether or not you are fit to be in the ministry. Well, there you went and ruined that. So we all took our things home. That was a Thursday, and the next day, of course, I had to go back to work at the hospital. So I worked and dealt with all the crazies up there. And when I wasn't dealing with the crazy people, I, there was a surgeon that I made good friends with. And uh, he, was a, he was a real nice guy. We kind of hung out together up in the surgeon's lounge. Anyway, and then Friday went, came and went, and then Saturday I had to go back to work and start it all over again. And you know, I'd go in at like 11 in the morning and I would work till 11 in the evening, then have to drive back. It was a particularly cold and bitter winter in Kentucky and very freezy, ice everywhere, roads very dangerous. Carol and I had this one old clunky Vega, had great horns on it, though I, I, they played the French national anthem. They were air horns. And, uh, you could hear them for miles. The professors at seminary hated those things. Anyway, uh, Saturday came and went. Then Sunday, I go, man, I got to get this stupid blue book done. And my idea was, I'll take it to work and I'll work on it there. Well, that didn't work out because that particularly Sunday, I guess every nut and a holler had to shoot one another. And they were all in all night long and it just went on and on and on. So it was Sunday evening, about 11, 11.30, quarter to 12 before I got out of there. And it was a 25 mile drive down a two lane little tiny mountain road from uh, back to Wilmore, from Lexington to Wilmore, where Lexington is where the, the med center was. So I'm driving, it's late at night, there's no guardrails or nothing, horse farms on either side. Pastures are beautiful, covered in snow, and the streets are icy, and it's just one of them picturesque things in the middle of the night. And then it started raining, and it was freezing rain, you know, a little kind of wet, but with bumps in it. And, and, and freezing rain is not that bad. You can keep it off the windshield, but the problem is it ices up the roads, and then the roads become very, very dangerous. So I had to slow down to at least, you know, 
20. And I'm going down this little road, middle of the night, and it's dark. And I see something up ahead. I see a little, some blinkers on the back of a car. And I'm going, oh, no, what's this? Somebody's in trouble. <coughs> so I'm slowing down, slowing down, thinking about maybe I can help, maybe I can help. Well, these two little old gray heads, you know, uh, crazy old women club of Kentucky, I guess. They were driving down the road, and I guess lost control of their car. And, and each side of the road, of course, got a little ditch in it. Nothing serious. I mean, it's not like you're plumbing or turning over or anything. But it's just a little ditch. And they got down in there, and of course, whoo, tire spin, and they're not going anywhere. So at 11.30, quarter to 12 at night, on a freezing night, pouring down freezing rain, I see these two poor little old ladies in this tiny little car stuck in a ditch. And there ain't nothing between Lexington and Wilmore, folks, nothing. And they're sitting there, and here's this old guy out there. He is wrinkled up and busted up and got a tow truck, and it's all rusted. And, and he's just, oh, you know, we've been doing this for 300 years. And he's out there, he's trying to hook it up and hook it up. And on the back of his truck, it's kind of half tore off, but it said, Jesus saves. And he was pulling those ladies out of that ditch and getting them up on the road and making sure they're okay and telling them all this stuff. I guess he was doing working for AAA. And uh, I just thought about that. And I sat there, I asked the guy if he needed any help. He goes, no, I got it under control. I said, okay. And I sat there for a minute just to make sure oh, I had it under control. And I looked at that, at, now it's midnight, you know, the rain's still pouring down, the streets are getting worse. I've still got 15, 20 miles to go to get back to our little apartment. And then uh, I got home and I came through the door. Carol was long since asleep. And I turned on a little lamp in the living room. I sat down and with my blue book. And I wrote, what is God? And I said, God is an 87-year-old mechanic in a freezing storm, a storm of freezing rain at midnight pulling two old ladies out of a ditch because there ain't nobody else there but him. That is God to me. I turned that in to Chuck Killian. Other guys wrote pages and pages, filled their blue book with all kinds of theories, all kinds of theologies, all kinds of eschatological references and everything else. And Chuck looked at me a few days after that and said, Mr. Shannon, would you come up here for a moment? Oh, Lord, here it comes. Should have talked about Conan. And I went up there, and he handed me that book, and it was folded over. He doesn't fold books over. Right? He goes, take this back, and you open it, and you think about what you wrote. And I took that back. And I opened it, and it, there was A plus, best answer ever. <laughs> wow. And I thought right then and there, that is God sometimes. That is God. He presents himself to us in ways that we can understand. I can only imagine what it must have been like in that same room, that same night with those same apostles. They're in the middle of this dinner. It was the Passover celebration. Everybody was a little tense. Everybody was a little scared. And Jesus gets on his hands and knees with a bucket of water and he starts washing those guys' feet. And then he says to Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen God. on his hands and knees, washing the feet. But see, Philip had some doubts. Lord, show us the Father, it'll be enough. Oh, Philip. You know, it must have brought a tear to Jesus' eye. Really? Really, you can't see it? If you can't believe in me and that I am in the Father and the Father's in me and that we are one together, believe at least in the works you've seen. You've seen people fed. You've seen people healed of every kind of malady. You've seen people raised from the dead. Who else does that? I don't think Jesus was mad at him. I think he was a little disappointed maybe. 
think he was a little disappointed sometimes, you know. God presents himself as an old 87-year-old mechanic with a worn-out truck and a freezing rain in the middle of the night pulling two poor gray hairs out of a ditch. Just as much as a savior of the world, the son of the living almighty God could be on his hands and knees and washing your feet. You see, doubt is okay if it takes you to look a little further, to understand a little more. And I don't think Jesus was mad, uh, disappointed maybe, but Philip was demanding more. Jesus said, you know, people have longed to see what you have seen. Generations have waited to see what you have seen. You know, Jesus ends that prayer, I mean, ends that service that night with a prayer. And when he prays, he said, God, I thank you you've given me these big guys. I thank you that you've taught them well. I thank you that you've worked the miracles and shown them who we are. And I pray for these guys that many others will come to know us through their word. But most of all, says Jesus, most of all, John 17, I pray for those who never will see and yet will believe. Wow. That was Jesus' last prayer. And then they went to Calvary. I pray for those who will never have the opportunity to see and yet we'll still come to believe. I don't know. I think God shows himself to us all the time. If we have eyes, we can see it. If we have ears, we can hear it. But I think he presents himself to us all the time. I believe that. It's been a hallmark of my ministry forever. I like that image of God on his hands and knees. I like that image of God pulling two old ladies out of the muck. Bruce Larson, great preacher, theologian, author. He got cancer one time, an aggressive cancer, a bad one. And he was mu very much afraid. And he says, yep, even the giants in theology can have doubts every once in a while. And he prayed and he prayed and they had a healing service and they put hands on him, dumped a couple hundred gallons of oil on him, blessed him, blessed him, blessed him, and nothing happened. He finally came to a point, and he writes in his own journal, it's an interesting, interesting word, he writes, waiting for my miracle. This was what he titled it under. Uh... Perhaps it's not so much my miracle of healing I'm waiting for or that I even need at this point. Maybe it's the miracle of just continuing to love and believe and live in the fellowship which God has granted me. Even if I die, to die in such a family of beautiful saints around me. Is that not a miracle? Sometimes you people and what you say and what you do, I, I laugh and I walk away. I don't tell you. I walk away and I think, okay, God, you're, you're messing with me again. Sometimes you guys are the ditch in the ditch. Sometimes you guys are the truck guy pulling them out. Sometimes you are the guys on your hands and knees. And God's given me an uncanny ability to see that and say, wow, I didn't see Robert today. I saw the Lord. I didn't see Haley today. I saw Satan. No, I mean the Lord. <laughs> Just seeing if Haley's awake back there. Henry David Thoreau was in an enigmatic individual at the end of the 1800s there. He was probably the first... He must have been from California. Actually, he's a Brit. Actually, he was a Scot Scotsman. But he must have visited California because he was the first vegan, I think, there ever was. 
uh, he wrote his famous work called Walden, and I don't know if you've ever read that or not. It's a, it's a, it is really a manual on naturalism, trying to be the naturalist. Everything you need, he believed, genuinely, everything we ever would need is found in the wild, found in the woods, found in nature. Uh, as far as things to eat, things to clothe ourselves, things to do, you know, everything is out there. And that we should have no need of any kind of mechanizations and no need, he had no need of spirituality. So if you read Walden, you'll see beautiful imagery of woods and, and, and huge, you know, crowning trees and beautiful mountains and waterfalls and everything that you just, you know, is a Polaroid moment and you go, wow, that's beautiful. But you won't hear or see anything about God. He simply didn't believe that we needed a God. And if there is a God, he's already given us everything we need in nature. Well, that's a fine line you walk there. It was when he was dying, his aunt came to him, who was a very strong uh, Christian woman, and said, Henry, have you made your peace with God? And he looked at her rather quizzically and said, well, I didn't know he and I had been arguing. <coughs> he leaves me alone, I leave him alone. What peace is there to be made? Even to his dying death, he would not acknowledge the need or there much for even the existence of God. Wow. He lived his whole life, at least he thought his whole life, in total completeness of the earth, but he was a rather fruitless individual. Then really come across with much. He did write the work Walden. I'd suggest you never read it. <coughs> An entire life devoid of God. Even to the last breath. And then, he wasn't a bad man. I'm not trying to say he was. He was totally complete, totally happy in the world. He only lacked one little ingredient, and that was the Lord that made this world. And Peter said, Jesus, I don't want to miss this. Show us the Father. I believe God presents Himself to us all the time. I think God evidences Himself in our lives all the time. It's only we who make that decision not to see it. Maybe in naivety, maybe in, in, in direct arrogance. I don't know. But fewer and fewer people I know are seeing God anywhere. They're not even looking for truth. Doubt is okay if it takes you further the next step, the next step to investigate and to at least consider whether or not God is. And if He is, what part are you playing in His presence? Are you playing a part in His presence? Or are you just sitting there eating bread and saying, yeah, this is great. Many theologians have thought as they've read this and maybe myself intended that wow, Jesus, I would have rearranged some of that stuff. I would have said it differently. I would have done it differently. But the fact of the matter is when you do read it, you hear the promise, you hear this, you hear that, and then you hear the commands, and then you hear the promise of heaven and through the Father, and then Philip says, yeah, will show us. Andy Howell is an old friend of mine, Andy and Margaret Howell. And they were in, where I went to the pulpit ministry here in America, they went to the missionary field in Africa. And they've been as long in that mission field as I've been in this mission field. And from time to time we talk, he calls me and, and stuff like this, we share stories. And uh, he told me once how he was watching some African porters. And these are the guys that carry the big, huge, heavy trunks and loads for the, you know, the would-be safari guys and the would-be, you know, whatever, thrill seekers. And he asked one of the porters once, he was singing a song of God. 
And Andy didn't try to preach to him anything. He, he came up and said, what are you singing there? And uh, the man answered, I'm singing praise for my Lord God. And he said, how do you know there is a God? Just, you know, messing with him. And that porter, big giant guy with his huge trunk on his back, let go of the trunk, he said, <laughs> hit the ground. And Andy thought, well, now I'm going to get beat up. And the man looked at Andy and said, how do you know I just dropped that trunk? I didn't turn around yet to see if I dropped that trunk. And Andy said, well, what does that mean? He says, well, that's how I know there's a God. And he says, how does that teach you about God? He says, because God has taken off of me the weight of my guilty heart and my sin. I know I've dropped that trunk, even though I'm not looking at it, because I feel the lightness and the relief of that heavy burden. And my life has been like that since I gave it to Jesus. And in my heart, there's a new song, which I sing. Well, Andy said, the missionary got schooled that day. He said, I got to get me a big trunk and carry it into church and teach these people. <laughs> That's faith without seeing, folks. That's believing without seeing. How do you know there's a God? Because you feel that weight lessen. That's the weight taken off my back. My years of riotous living, my years of hatreds, my years of angers, all the hurts I've caused. Yeah, we all got that trunk, you know that? We all got that trunk. It just depends on whether or not we continue to carry it. Or whether maybe just that one day, that one moment, as Many theologians over the years have said that one divine moment when suddenly we're light, when suddenly our eyes are opened and I saw heaven's light again for the first time. <coughs> Show us God, it will be enough. Evidence of God is everywhere. In fact, Jesus prays for us. I pray for you men because you've seen and you've walked with me. But boy, I pray and I have greater hopes for those who will never see and yet will still believe. Have your blue books back by Monday and all I wrote was a couple of sentences about an old bent over broken down old man in a freezing rain in the middle of the night saving two little gray hairs. If I ain't never seen God, that was it. I want you to take this blue book back, go sit in your desk, open it, and think about what you've done. You saw God. Let us pray. <laughs> Father, I do thank you for this morning, and I thank you, just praise you, for all the times you present yourself in a flicker of light, in a simple butterfly, in a circumstance, it doesn't matter. Everywhere. I glorify you, Father, and I praise you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who also glorified you. And I pray that we too can become men and women who can also glorify you. Glorify you because we've seen you. Bless this congregation this morning and let them take an image of the Lord with them everywhere they go. For you have shown us the Father. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.